Hello and welcome to Advanced Retro Adaptics. In this episode, I recorded a conversation with Matt Smeda. So, out of the blue, this guy emails me and uh, he says, Hey, I just got back from a sailing trip. Uh, I built a, a, a tiny house. I've lived in a bell tent. I've listened to your podcasts. I think you're a pessimist and I disagree with you. And I said, amazing. Would you like to record a podcast with me? And this is the result. So uh, for me, this was a really wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed chatting with Matt. We talk about all sorts of stuff from artificial intelligence alignment, existential risk, uh, personalized ways to approach how to have a meaningful life in the world, dissensus, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. So it's a really great uh, conversation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully we're going to have more conversations in the future. We recorded this conversation a few weeks ago, but then storms hit, my internet went out. I've had kind of a whole thing uh, going on with uh, internet and communication stuff. I'll talk more about that later in an update, but um, this is a few weeks old, but I'm really excited to finally get this out to you. Um, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Matt Smeda. In retrospect, it feels kind of irresponsible to have sent that over to you without that caveat, because when I, when I use that word, it has like kind of a negative connotation, but I didn't mean it in the negative sense. What I meant by saying something like Tyler is pessimistic was something closer to Tyler um, is more interested in, in competence rather than driving technology forward, which in my view, driving technology forward is the only way to do, to like, make the world continue to make the future continue to go well mm. in other words another way of putting that in the context of of the metaphor that you've used before is it's not sufficient to um to make lifeboats but rather so we've got the ship and the ship is going down but from my worldview it's not sufficient to make lifeboats because the ocean is boiling <laughs> and so we can make lifeboats, sure. So that's a solution to one problem. But not only is this ship going to, to founder, but in addition, it's worse than that. And the ocean is boiling. So like, let's solve, let's solve a problem. Well, we can make lifeboats. From my perspective, though, the pessimism comes in in the sense that we're trying to solve the wrong kind of problem by making lifeboats. And instead, we've got to solve a, actually a harder problem which is to make the ship fly. And that's, that's uh, incredibly difficult, much more difficult than building a, and less fun uh, than building a lifeboat flotilla, or, or if you want to call it just a flotilla and discard that other word, then that's cool too, <laughs> uh, because, because of the connotation you yeah, mentioned right. with lifeboat. Um, but yeah, so my sense is that we've got to make the ship fly and if we don't then like there's nothing left yeah um yeah so that's that's where i'm coming from when i say oh tyler's pessimistic it's like yeah it's it's not that i have i have the sense that you're you're negative uh, in fact in that journal entry i think i say in the same line something like he's pessimistic but he has a good attitude and i i, I want to double down on that like <laughs> i love i love the attitude that you're coming to the podcast with and just that you seem to be approaching life with this attitude of like cultivating your stoke and i'm like that's the thing that's attracting me to this to to tyler to to tyler's podcast cool. and yeah that's that's why i felt compelled to uh, to reach out i'm super glad you did uh for a number of reasons i mean our, our communication so far has been really uh rich for me and um, i'm also really excited just to chat with you uh in real time for the first time uh, and yeah, I, I really appreciate everything you said. And I think, uh, you, you know, when you sent that email to me originally and I read it, I was like, whoa, I think he maybe under misunderstood me. And then I went back and I looked at the transcript for that episode that you were referencing, the hyper competence loop, I believe. Yep. I was like, oh, yeah, all right. I see, I see where he got this idea. Um, and, and it's not that I think that you misunderstood me. Um, uh, to, a, to a large extent, I think, I mean, my, my own thinking and framing of, of all this stuff is, is constantly in motion. And I have had such a rich introspective experience thinking about 
how I view everything since you sent me that email. Um, and so it's not so much that I'm saying, I think what I wrote then was wrong, is that I have a more intricate, fine-grained uh, self-understanding of what I think now because of interacting with your, your critique or your response to it. So I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, uh, it is the most intellectually rewarding thing I've been doing in the last several months. So I'm like really uh, appreciative of that. Um, but to dive into it a little bit, uh, you know, and I think I mentioned in my response to you that I'm starting to rethink the whole lifeboat flotilla metaphor because I think it's so easy to, um, there's a lot of baggage with the word flotilla. There's a lot of, and it's like, what do we mean when we say ship? What do we mean when we say ocean? What do we mean when we say flotilla? What do we mean when we say the captain? You know, all these things, right? Um, and it's, it's, I mean, I, we could write a book on, oh, this is what I mean for this. This is what I mean for this. And then at some point it's like, all right, maybe we should just talk about the thing instead of trying to build up this really <laughs> hyper sophisticated metaphor. Um, but um, I think that you and I mm, agree. Well, okay. So, so you, you talked about, all right, in your view, the way you're talking about, we need to make the ship fly because the ocean is boiling. Um, and there's this idea of like, uh, competence versus pushing technology forward. So I think the first thing to get out the gate and the first, um, the first main simple takeaway that I've had as a result of dealing with what you've um, brought up for me is I think that competence is the starting point. And then I think from there, if so, uh, so I think that uh, to break that out a little bit further, I think that becoming uh, post consumers is the starting point. I think that we need to, uh, we can use other words, decolonize whatever our minds that we, we're, we're no longer thinking in a default consumerism from a default consumerism perspective. Um, because to my mind, consumerism is um, you solve problems by buying stuff, right? So you've got a hammer, everything's a nail, right? Um, and I think. Yeah, I've got to say, sorry to interrupt, but I've got to say that one of one of the one of the differences between you and I is I kind of take that for granted. So I I've really framed this for just how to view my own life, whereas you're taking a perspective, a more helpful perspective to the world, which is one where you're trying to broadcast a message to offer help, offer a way, like a way for people to look at this stuff. Whereas when I'm thinking about this, I'm really I've really just been doing more introspection rather than trying to broadcast. Sure. And this this speaks to the fact that I I'm I'm not the one with a website or an online presence. I just kind of am doing this kind of stuff with myself and with a couple of my friends. But that's mm -hmm. about it, right? Yeah. So, so so yeah, I've I've basically I've taken this need to get to the end of personal consumerism, or, or not the end of it, right? But like sort of make it less of a mandate in my own life i've taken that for granted mm. as already a solved problem whereas yeah. you when you're trying to help out other people um you cannot take for granted that that is a solved problem you need to help people get there that seems to be part of your mission yeah yeah definitely it is and i feel like uh that is a big part of my mission and i i am for me the last three years of my life has been about internalizing this post-consumer mindset um, I, I have been anti-consumerist for many, many years. I had a, had a very sophisticated critique of the system, and yet uh, uh, I was uh, my life, you know, viewed by my actions. Maybe there was some stuff that looked kind of post-consumerist, but it really just kind of looked like it wasn't deeply post-consumerist. So I still had a lot of um, stuff to work out, um, and yeah. that's like all I've been focused on for the last three years. And so part of the reason why I keep hammering on this is because I'm like, okay, part of, part of my, my work that I've decided for myself is to try to communicate some of this to other people, as you rightly say. Um, and so I'm trying to like refine that message and like, all right, what, what is the best or some of the best ways to communicate that? And it also reinforces it for myself. And it's like, okay, this is really fresh for me right now. In another five years, 10 years, it is likely that I will be less able to talk about it in a way that is useful for people who are closer to this transition because i'm close to this transition right now so it's like okay now is the right time for me to be spending time thinking about and talking about and thinking about how to talk about like this space um so 
yeah. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, in, internalized post-consumer mindset, get to that point. Um, and I think that there, there's a lot of uh, resilience that that brings to one's lifestyle. You're harder to kill, all these other things. Um, and then it's like, okay, and then what do you do about your life? Right? Because the whole point, I'm, many people would critique uh, post-consumer lifestyle and say like, well, your own personal footprint really doesn't matter. You know, they might say, oh, it's the billionaires. They have really high footprint or whatever. You, you live on six earths. You get down to a one earth lifestyle. That's still a, a drop in the bucket on a world with eight billion people or whatever. So it, do, it doesn't matter mathematically speaking. And it's like, well, okay, we could argue about that. But also I don't really care because that's not really the point. The point isn't like, oh, I'm going to save the world because I don't eat meat or whatever. Like I don't drive a car, whatever, right? Like I don't think that that's going to save the world, but it's what I and what other people can do with their lives once they've reached that point and they have more cognitive tools rather than just the consumerism hammer to show up and express their gifts in the world. So so, so with the metaphor, I like the metaphor. <laughs> I like the metaphor of, uh, so, so I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna agree, but but twice. This, uh, I want a flying lifeboat flotilla. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to me. It, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm I'm super not yeah, anti. Good. Well, I I've spent time in my life being anti technological progress, and that was a rejection of techno utopianism, which to me was a sort of shallow like, oh, they'll figure it out. We just need to get some entrepreneurs on this, and like it'll be fine. Don't worry about it, guys. And I was like, we should worry about this. Um, but I'm not. I, like there are things we need. There are products we need, services we need, technologies we need, science we need that we don't have yet, I think, to, to, to transition into and live in the kind of world that most of us want to live in, right? Um, unless you're a neo-primitivist or an anarcho-primitivist, you know, on that end of the spectrum, right? In which case, we don't need any more of that. But I am not um, an anarcho-primitivist, although I've flirted with them from time to time. <laughs> uh. um, but uh, you know, my the the, uh, the the ship is going down thing for me. You know, when I think of the ship, I think of the ship for me is a metaphor of the current arrangement. And so I think we need a different arrangement because I think the current arrangement is self-terminating. Um, and whether that means we need to take some of the stuff from the ship and build a life flotilla, whether that means we need to invent anti-grav boosters and get the ship off off the ocean. Like whatever, whatever the appropriate metaphor is, um, uh, what, what, what we have in the future one way or another is going to look different than it is now. The worst possible case is just an ocean that's boiling and there's no ship and there's no people. That's worst case, right? Um, yep. Uh, barely above that is some life, like just some lifeboats on the surface of this boiling ocean. Also not great. Um, that's pretty limited. And then... Yeah, maybe maybe we can maybe we can glide path or put wings on this ship, and it can take off. The thing I don't like that is about it. It smacks of centralism. I like I like I'm um, attracted to the idea of decentralized solutions. Like, all right, you guys, you have this idea. Okay, you go that way. These folks, they're trying to work on this. Cool, and like everyone's trying a bunch of different stuff. Um, I kind of like that idea. So. I learned a word from you on your on a recent podcast episode of yours the census the opposite of consensus and that's yes. coming through right now yeah. um and that that kind of speaks to or brings up the question for me what's wrong with the ship and there are there's a number of questions there's a number of possible answers rather to that question which is like what's wrong with in other words what is wrong with the world right now so the things that come up for me are are the things like all right, well, we've got nukes. That could be a problem. We've got the possibility for engineered pandemics and it becomes easier year by year to, for some deranged person to like create one of these pandemics. We've got climate change, uh, which I think uh, we've got climate change driven by um, oil depletion and oil burning and well, not just oil, but fossil fuels just generally. Um, and the and another possibility is the misapplication of misapplication and bad and careless deployment of AI systems over the next couple of years. These are all problems that could threaten the ship right now, and they all like they all appear differently or could 
appear differently in the metaphor. And by the way, you made a comment earlier saying something like, maybe we shouldn't make the metaphor fancier and instead we should just talk about this stuff. But the metaphor is a good way, it's a good language and a good compression of talking about these issues, right? So it's, I think it's a good thing to talk through metaphors uh, just generally speaking, yeah. but probably in each of those, like I just listed out four or five potential failure modes for, for all of us, um, that could probably be extended to the, to the ship lifeboat ocean system, uh, metaphor that we've got here. So it's like for nukes, well, someone brought a bomb on board and like, like 10 people have a button or something like that. You could yeah. say you could say something like this and lifeboats would probably be a good solution to that. And, and, yeah. and I'm not you know, we can speak about this in the context of just the metaphor, but then apply it to real life too. It's like when you think about when you think about nukes, and I don't want to discuss this for too long, but what is it? Something like five to fifteen countries that have a number of nukes. I used to think that North Korea was a threat here, right? And they are they are a threat in a certain capacity but their nuclear arsenal is very small compared to the nuclear arsenals of places like the us and russia right so in the past i guess this was back in like 2018 or something like that and i heard that like the kim jong-un was going crazy i'm like oh no the world's going to end soon because of nukes but i didn't recognize the fact that quantity of nukes matters it's not just mm -hmm. like oh they have nukes therefore the world's going to end when one guy goes crazy not there's a little bit more than than just that there and the reason i'm bringing this up is because if that's the problem if the problem is north korean nukes then a lifeboat flotilla answer is actually appropriate in that case because it's like well yeah part of the world's going to be damaged and and between hundreds of thousands and millions of people could stand to die and that sucks obviously but there are much worse fates and a lifeboat flotilla could actually save many people in such a scenario. There are other scenarios like some, some particularly bad AI scenarios that are much worse than merely hundreds of millions of people dying. <laughs> oh, come on, please. Hundreds of millions. Who cares? Right. Yeah. Bad. Um, but actually not as bad as it could possibly be uh, and that's that's where i bring that other that other metaphor in um and and by the way why are we talking about this one reason to talk about this stuff is to make decisions about how to live one's own life so when i when i say something like something in my journal entry that i sent to you that kicked this whole thing off i was i was um thinking like all right well yeah i feel this temptation to go and work on things like solar solar powered wells but it feels like that's insufficient because it feels like while it would be fun to make to participate in the flotilla it feels like that's not enough and i feel compelled to go and do something that addresses one of those several problems that i just that I just described, and 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 also the problem that feels like a dom, the problem that feels to me like is dominating the rest of those problems, yeah. which is that AI catastrophe one. Yeah. It's like who cares about the nukes? The AI catastrophe is much worse, and therefore I need to focus all of my attention on that. One last thing that I'll say before before handing it back over to <laughs> you is, in your email to me, you said something like, "Hey Matt." If you think that you can contribute to AI alignment, Godspeed. <laughs> and I looked at that and I said, I'm not sure that I can though. This is really fucking hard. I've been, tr I've been working on this for the last couple months and I've, I've uh, learned that, yeah, it's a hard problem. <laughs> it's not only, not only computer science stuff hard, um, but just trying to solve many of the deeper and richer problems. Like, like I feel, let me put it this way. It feels like the hike, a very difficult hike to the top of uh, a really, a really gross trail up to the top of a mountain. And I am stumbling in the parking lot before getting <laughs> yeah. to that. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, that's yeah. how I'm feeling about that. Uh, yeah. I want to uh, talk more about the AI stuff. Um, and get some of your thoughts on it. Um, I think that, you know, cause we're talking about, you're talking about what's, you're talking about problems that are referred to as exorists, right? 
existential risk, which is, yeah. okay, how, how are the ways we could all die? How are the ways, like, the worst possible this could happen? Artificial intelligence, various nuclear um, scenarios, bioterror, blah, 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 climate change, atmosphere goes anoxic, like, all these things, right? Um, and uh, th obviously, those are huge risks, and risks need to be mitigated, and, and people need to be working on that. Uh, that's one category of thing. Um, and I'll just say, like, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think I have the training, the mind, the inclination, whatever, to work on nuclear proliferation strategy, AI. I'm just not that good at math, like, well, some other things. And so I've kind of thought, like, okay, for myself, those are those are things that I hope that people like you and other really smart people are working on, and I hope they're doing a great job, and I will support them emotionally and ecumenically as much as I can. Um, and then another, there's, and then another kind of genre category of way, way, ways to think about um, living is on the building of, let's call it life support systems that are appropriate to the world we need. So for example, when I think of the ship, one of the things I think about is the fact that we get, we, we things are arranged such that we get most of our energy from problematic sources like fossil fuels, and we use a lot of it, right? Like the whole, the, the whole problem is not necessarily like that we use fossil fuels, it's that we use a lot of fossil fuels, right? And yeah. as someone who works in professional energy efficiency in the built environment for 12 years and got my training in that, like I know that we, everyone, can use a lot less. And then now since my eerie journey, I'm like, oh, and like we can, we can use dramatically less resources, energy, and all these other things than we are and have good and maybe even better lives. And so from, from the perspective of looking at the problems that are, we're using too much stuff, we're poisoning the atmosphere, we're poisoning the oceans, like all these things that are related to the amount of consumptions that we're doing, one of the ways to go about addressing those problems is to go about developing, creating, moving viable, et cetera, alternative life support systems that um, I just know. Do we have the same pencil right now? I know. We're... <laughs> uh, that looks like a similar, similar, but not quite exactly the same. I've got this oh, yeah. Alvin with Matic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, uh... For audio listeners, we both held up a, this blue pencil. <laughs> oh, man. This, is, this is going too well. Um, all right. Um, I think one of the ways one can uh, uh, frame what to do with their life, and the way I do, because it's my source of stoke, is, uh, like I said, building, innovating, constructing, etc., life support systems that um, use way fewer resources, way less energy, uh, don't contribute to rainforest destruction, like all these things, right? Um, I just, I uh, did, a, I'm, I'm going to start doing book reviews, podcast episodes, and I'm really into the new Alchemy Institute. We'll talk about that later, but like they're all about life support systems and like, hey, we can build shelter and energy systems and food production systems that don't take as many resources. And so that is a huge, that is a big burden off of the planet and other things. And so, and that is one of my, when I think of the ship in the metaphor, I think one of the problems of the ship is that it uses a ton of energy and resources and other things to support life. And by life, you know, I'm kind of using it broadly speaking. Yes, I mean food, energy, water, shelter, but I also mean like supporting one's life, like systems that are supportive of living a good, full, dignified human life, justice, yep. and all these sorts of things. So, um, and I, and, and I mean, I think, you know, whether to look at X risk, whether to look at life support systems, whether to look at just having fun and being entertaining, like that's a totally personalized stoke led thing. And I just, I just like seeing people doing different things. So that, uh, that quick break that we just, that we just had there allowed me to go over to the bookshelf and grab one of the pieces of required reading that we have for, uh, for AI safety. Uh. So this Book called Human Compatible. Uh, it's like one of one of maybe two or three important books to read while trying to get into this field right now. It's it's part of all of the recommended curriculum. Mm. 
and I was kind of surprised at, well, mm, yeah, let's say, let's put it that way. I was kind of surprised to read the final part of the book before it gets into the appendices is called Enfeeblement and Human Autonomy. Mm. And the, this last section of the book is talking essentially to what you're, what you're mentioning right now. It says something along the lines of, well, if we do make beneficial AI systems that are aligned with us and therefore don't turn us all into paper clips or something like that, we are still going to need people who aren't just dependent mm. on whatever new technology that we have. So even, even if we do have a cluster of people that are working to make these systems and an, an even smaller cluster working to make those systems safe, those are not the same thing. They're mm -hmm. really different. We are still going to need your, as you describe it, a dissensus of people, or if I'm using that right, we're going to need some dissensus uh, where some people are saying, I'm opting out of this and I'm going to retain this sense of autonomy and competence that is not that is related to, but only uses those new beneficial systems as kind of a component of the life, rather than as a central, as one of the central like guiding principles of that life. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I thought in, in my couple moments of weakness that I have, and that I have while working on this stuff, I think, that's a backup plan that I personally have, right? So if it turns out that this stuff ends up being too hard, which by the way, you said something earlier in the conversation, which was something like, we need people like Matt working on this. And I thought to myself, that might not be me actually. <laughs> so I'm still trying to figure that out now. Yeah. But one of the possible backup plans there is exactly what you're describing right now, which is just, yeah, we've, we've got to have people going out in different directions. And one of the reason for that is that this AI thing, this AI alignment problem might not actually be a problem. Mm. It, it could just, it could just turn out that, you know, just like, I think to some, I think back to something like people who extrapolated about horse poop in the streets back in like the 1850s. Right. It's like, hey, let's extrapolate forward all of the all of the need for more horse horse infrastructure as we like ramp up the ramp up the city or something like that. Oh, whoops! Not actually a problem at all. We have cars now, yeah. right? And cars brought their own problem, and we've got to solve that problem now too. Uh, so we're still working on solving the cars problem, but point is that it's not the horse poop problem anymore. Um, so that's the sense that I mean, that's just the sense that I'm coming to with like, turn, maybe it turns out that AI is just not an AI alignment is just not an issue. Um, and therefore it's probably important as you're pointing out to have people following their stoke and working on the things that they actually care about that are, potential problems conditioned on AI not being an issue, right? Like, like I'm pointing out that if, if AI is actually uh, an issue, then it probably does dominate those other things. But if it's not, then we will need people working on solutions to those other things you're pointing out. Right. You know, I, I think one way to frame our conversation and what we're talking about is the fact that we're talking about being wise at scale. Because what we're talking, you know, um, uh, maybe I should, maybe I should work on AI, but maybe it's not a problem. Um, and I, uh, well, actually, let, let me frame it this way: uh, I, I want to build shelter and infrastructure that's life support systems uh, for people, so that a hundred years from now, we're using a thimble full of energy, we have good lives, we're eating delightful veggies from our front yard, whatever. But all of that work I do on making our ships or whatever it is I'm doing won't mean anything if we're all paper clips by then, right? Or if we all get nuked or blah, blah, blah. But I can't know. And is that not the same question as like, mm, I should save for retirement or I should make long-term plans, but I could get hit by a concrete truck tomorrow. So what do you do? And, and it's this, it, it, it's a problem that requires wisdom to live a good life because if I'm like, well, I could get hit by a concrete truck tomorrow, so I'm just going to do all the drugs because that's <laughs> yeah, why yeah, not, yeah. right? But, 
uh, on the other hand, if I assume, if, if I, assume I'm, I have no risk in my life, uh, then I'll, I'll just always constantly be thinking about and working towards the future and I won't ever actually enjoy my time now. And so like it requires wisdom to deal with that problem to which there are no easy answers, I think. That's why we have sages and like spiritual leaders and stuff like that, right? Um, and it's like now we're just dealing with that question at a like global species scale. Yep. Um, yeah, acting in the face of uncertainty is the name of the game as you, pu as you put it in one of our emails, right? So finding finding some kind of strategy that is robust in the, in the case, in all of these different cases is, it seems to be an important thing. Mm -hmm. One other thing is like, uh, I think that maybe, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but maybe you said something just now, uh, like if we all turn in, into paper clips, then what was the point of anything? Well, actually there was a point while we were still here and enjoying ourselves, right? and preparing for futures that could have come that ended up not coming. But, and that's sad that like maybe all value is destroyed in some sense. <laughs> that's the wrong way of putting that, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it would suck if all value is destroyed and all lives are destroyed. But in the meantime, if we had good flourishing lives and we're preparing for different versions of the future and trying to solve different problems and just enjoying ourselves generally, then, then it meant something that we were here. Um, so in that sense, it's all good. And I think that's, yeah, that's like the perfect way to frame, like, like, I don't know what I'm trying to talk about. Like, that's kind of the whole point is for me is like, we don't know what's going to happen. The few, like predicting the future is a terrible idea. Um, it just, it basically doesn't work out. Although thinking about it and like arranging things to be able to arrive in the future in a way that's good is a good thing. But like, universe is the heat death of the universe everyone's gonna die do you really think humans are gonna exist as a species in one million years much less five billion like it doesn't matter like have a good life do good things you know and it's like and it's i i i i can be kind of terrible uh a terrible comforter because like someone will be down about something and they'll be like oh don't worry about it at night go up look at the stars and contemplate the fact that we're all gonna die soon and <laughs> not helpful tyler but like to me that is such a soothing like thought that in in some sense we can argue ourselves that um, it is it is nothing but the present moment matters um, and also you, and I've I've got um, uh, um, someone I know his name is Dalen I think he'd be alright with me saying that he would pro he, he I have no idea what he would say right now but I'm remembering him talking about how time is a construct and it probably doesn't really exist. And so like worrying about the future is kind of worrying about a strange illusion of the thing anyways, but um, yeah, yeah. It's what we can see. So it feels pretty real to us. And while it might be a construct, um, well, I guess time is just a construct, sort of like reaching into this dimension is a construct too. <laughs> real to me to reach side to side or up and sure. down forth <laughs> so i'm gonna keep using time it's also good for coordinating group tasks like like for instance if we've got a if we've got a concrete pour coming up on saturday morning in the uh on the on the north side of the workshop it's good if we all show up at 7 30 for that and so that like one person isn't isn't like hey like what the hell like i thought, I thought we were gonna pour this concrete right now like, let's do that yeah yeah no that's true i feel like there's a there's a stage where it's like you think time is real and so you're effective. And then you think, and then you realize that time isn't real and you spend anywhere between five minutes and the rest of your life being totally ineffectual because you understand that time isn't real. And then you reach the phase where you realize that even though it isn't real, it doesn't matter and you're just gonna pretend like it is. And then you're back to being effective, but maybe being less stressy about things. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's a good way of putting it. So if you, if you start to transcend, but don't fully transcend, then you just wasted the rest of your life. <laughs> If you yeah, can start crossing that bridge better get to the other side of the bridge <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly there's there's several things in life that aren't necessarily uh necessary but once begun you have to finish it that's right that's right that's that reminds me of the time that i uh i don't know why my mind went to this we'll, we can edit this out but i, I learned uh I learned a different keyboard layout for a little while because I'm like, oh, the the QWERTY keyboard layout is like not not the most effective one, so I'm gonna go learn a different one because clearly that's the best way to do that. Right. So I did, 
Um, but on the way there, it's like, now I don't know any keyboards. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Well, you got to go pick one or the other. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll continue. I'll continue this, uh, this uh, boat ride over to learning Dvorak instead of QWERTY. Uh, the epilogue to that story is when I went and got a, a job in the real workforce and had to work with other people at my workstation. They were confused by my weird keyboard layout. So it's like, to be a normal person, I should probably just switch back. Yeah. So I should switch back. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I, and, I, and I also feel like uh, I was kind of reflecting in our little break as well. I, it, a, a theme for me is, 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 is just what we were just talking about. Like, oh, this isn't the most efficient or this isn't the best way. So we're going to do this. And then having a mellowing in my perspective on things. Like I felt like I, I, my lifestyle can be viewed as, a, as, a, as lots of phases of harsh rejections or maybe like idealistic rejections or aesthetic rejections or whatever. And I go and do that. I'm like, all right, great. I've proved, what did I prove? I'm not sure, but you know, I'm going to, and then I'm going to take a st couple steps back. And um, I think that's fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But um, one of the, one, one of the step back, steps back that I'm in the process of taking is a perspective on um, technology, entrepreneurship, engagement with the world, uh, engagement with the systems that exist now, because they're the ones we've got, right? And I actually, um, I, I, I kind of, because you know, I spent last year, 20, in 2022, I spent six months uh, mostly in, in Europe. Uh, I spent a month in Morocco as well, but mostly in Europe. And so I was experiencing like a very closely related but slightly different culture than the one that I grew up in, which is the West Coast of the United States. Um, and I spent some time in Europe before, but this is the first time I was really, I, was, I, was, I don't know, maybe as immersed in the culture. And one of my takeaways was the culture that I was born into has some problems. And I've spent many years being very critical of many of those problems and, and wishing that I lived in a culture that didn't have those problems. And where I'm at now is I, I experienced a, different, a, a culture that both I was expecting a lot of the Europeans that I hung out with to be more as critical or more critical of the same things I was critical of about, about American culture. And they weren't, or maybe they were just being polite, but they weren't. And I was just like, yeah, that's okay, but your music is great. <laughs> and, uh, and I experienced some things about European culture that I was like, I don't really like this. I was like, I think I would like this if I was European, if I'd grown up in Europe. But there's some stuff about America that actually – I, I have critiqued like individualism in, in certain ways and some other things that I just kind of like it. Not even necessarily because I think it's better. I don't necessarily. It's just what I grew up with. And I'm like, this is what so I like. So you don't necessarily like that you like it, but you in a certain sense have no choice but to like it because that's what you grew up with. That, that, is, a way, that is a way to put it. Yeah. And I've just reached a point of acceptance where it's like, Look, this is what I'm good at. I would I, I make a better American than an, a European because I grew up in this country and you know whatever. And it's like and and I think there's some people who are like, no, I really don't like X Y Z about American culture or whatever culture they grew up in. And they're like, so screw this, I'm leaving. I now live in Spain. I now live in France. Like wherever they live, uh, and that's totally fine. But I realize that that's just not for me. There's just some things that I'm like, ah, this is problematic, but. Eh whatever, I like it. So I'm just going to run with it. And it's, it's not like, um, it's, I, I'm not advocating and I'm, I don't believe I'm living a, a sort of unreflective way of embodying some of these traits and cultural attributes. Um, but it's like, well, look, if you, let's just say you have a hundred countries and you arrange them on a line between most individualistic and least individualistic. And this is just one of the cultural differences that I was observing and thinking about. Yes. Somebody's got to be on the far left and someone's going to be on the far right, right? Like some, some countries are going to be the most individualistic. Some countries going to be the least individualistic and they're going to have people in there. And that's kind of, that's just, that's just fine. That's okay. And I think I can be a more effective as a person who grew up in this culture um, and interacts with it rather than going to some other culture that I would have to learn. Like, it, it's like, I will always be a better English speaker than a speaker of any other language because I, because I was raised monolingual, right? Like some people, maybe they're bilingual, like truly bilingual. That's not me. I'm always going to be monolingual in English. And I think I'm also always going to be monocultural in terms of 
individualism, even though I can go live in Europe and enjoy it and love it and like really ri have rich experiences with that. I'm not over there like, oh, they want to hang out all the time. What is this? You know, it's like, no, it's, it's totally fine. Um, but I'm just going to be better, you know, on the one end of the spectrum rather than the other. Yeah, you just mentioned the spectrum of individualism and you alluded to the spectrum of like how many languages can one speak, right? So if, if the cost of integrating into a different kind of culture were, were, well, it's a balance of at least two things there. One is the cost of switching your own way of, of mm. approaching or showing up in the world in this example, by learning another language or just internalizing the ability to be less individualistic. If, if it were necessary for you to change things up to like, if it were necessary to get into a different culture, really, if, if you really needed to get out of the US and go live somewhere else, then you would do it, even if it cost a lot. And if it were, if it were to take a lot of effort to change yourself, then you would, but probably the situation is not even approaching that right now for mm -hmm. you. Right. So it's like, well, I can live better in the, uh, in the West coast of the U S because it's still pretty awesome over there. Yeah. Yeah. Well put, well put. And I think there's, I mean, there's a few different ways one can look at it and approach that because, you know, the, the, the critiques of individualism, it's like, bad individualism but there's examples of good individualism right and so it's like maybe maybe i can live in this culture that's individualistic and work on telling stories about exemplifying lifting up etc good individualism like let's do some good things as individuals and like explore that and that's fine similar to like um the whole like toxic masculinity right like it's not the masculinity that's the issue. It's the toxic bit that's the issue. I'm against toxic things. I'm not against masculine things, right? So let's have positive, you know, good generative, whatever the right adjectives are, masculinity. And like, let's work on that. And I'm going to be better at doing that than just like, all right, let's take the toxic bit and the masculine bit and throw all that out. And just like, there's no more of that in me. It's like, that's not me. That's not my story. That's not how that's going to work. So let me work on being a non-toxic masculine, you know, have, having non-toxic masculine traits uh, rather than trying to do something else. But, you know. It's in fashion to throw the baby out with the bathwater right now, though. This is one of the reasons why I'm not on social media. Um, because I, I, although I'm like vaguely familiar with what you're talking about, I'm just kind of uh, blissfully ignorant <laughs> to a lot of it. Um, however, I, I've done my own throwing the baby out with the bathwater there, which is I'm not really, I'm not really showing up in the world so much. Like I've not got social media accounts, but I also don't have an online presence. This is one of the things I admire about you. Actually, you're you're putting yourself out there with with uh, advanced re retro adaptics. So you've got your own version of like showing up out there, where I, whereas I've kind of crawling under my rock, and I'm like, I'm just gonna hang out under this rock now. This is great. <laughs> It's like, well, there are some good things about being under the rock, but it's not everything. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. And I, I mean, it, as someone who's spent a fair amount of his life under a rock, um, yeah, there, there's some benefits to it. And when, I mean, when you're ready, you're ready. <laughs> it's not good to come out from under the rock until you're ready. But I mean, you, 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 should, you should start a podcast. Uh, if and when you feel like having an online province, I think you would kill it because you've got really great, I don't know, presence. I'm really enjoying this conversation and I think people would respond well to uh, Matt being out in the world. Matt, can you tell me how to pronounce your last name? Smeda. 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 Yeah. Just uh, take the Z and pretend it doesn't exist. Cool. I, I was making it, I was putting more of an A in there at some point. Smeda, but that's not right. So Smeda. However, I had a, I had a professor in college, a Polish guy, and he says, Hey, Matt, you know, you're saying your name wrong. And I said, oh, yeah, Dr. Vol, how do I say my name? And he said, it's Schmeider. And I said, Thank <laughs> oh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I feel like because my last name is pronounceable by like the, the ma vast majority of all humans on the planet, regardless of um, what language they speak. So I've always felt really like I need to get everyone else's name as 
correct as I possibly can because I don't know what it's like to have my last name mispronounced. Although all Europeans call me Taylor for some reason. Taylor, okay. I, a, a, a lot of them, yeah, they, they call me they call me Taylor, which is fine. Do you just roll with that or do you say like, listen guys, we gotta have a conversation about how to <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, my, I, I have uh, my, my great-grandmother's perspective on the thing. You can call me whatever you like as long as you don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> Thanks, Grandma. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So um, we we could talk for a long time um, about a great many things. I'm interested in a lot of things, but can you tell me quickly about your, um, or as long as you want, about your sailing trip? Because you just went on a, a bit of a, of, a, of a sailing adventure. I'd like to hear more about yeah, that. Yeah, this, this was uh, this was fueled by, or one of the reasons why I went on the sailing trip was because. I was feeling that sense of discontent when working as an actuary for a while there. I had, I had a number of jobs as a life insurance actuary and eventually I'm just like, this doesn't feel right. And it feels like there's, there's something else that I could be working on. Um, it wasn't ultimately sailing and I never thought that I was going to work. Like my life's work was going to be, I am a sailor, but I felt cooped up for a number of years, right? So I thought, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick through this for a while and then I'm gonna go have some kind of adventure. Part of that, by the way, was driven by the sense of existential dread. Maybe we'll all die in five years. So before that happens, I'd like to sail. I, or <laughs> if not sail, I'd like to take some kind of adventure. Okay. Um, so I, as I was winding down my as I was considering winding down my, my final job as an actuary, I still hadn't made the decision yet, but as I was considering other options for myself, I started learning how to sail. So this was back in 2021. Um, as I went through that year, I first read a book, then I watched some YouTube videos and I was like, wait a second, I can actually go do this. So I rented a, I rented a single one person sailboat as part of the Sunfish fleet and learn how to sail a small boat. Uh, eventually, I upgraded to uh, to crewing on sailboat races uh, on this on one of the lakes here in Central Florida. Um, so shout out to Richard for that. <laughs> Richard Richard had uh, I showed up one day to the uh, to the Wednesday afternoon races with a sign that had two words in Sharpie marker on a piece of paper. It said need crew <laughs> and Richard said come over here <laughs> so I so I started sailing with Richard and finally I ended up on a website called crewseekers.net it's like online dating but instead of romance you get like like boats um, so I, it, it's possible to get both actually that's true um, and they have they have a section of their website that, that says you can either sign up as solo or partner but they're very specific with that partner setting that, and they say, this is if you already have a partner, this is not for trying to find romance. So probably they've had problems with that in the past. I can imagine, yeah. But I signed up as the solo and I, I put my little sailing resume there. It's like, I've sailed some fish, I've done races, and I've actually learned how to single hands like 20 foot boats too. And Bob from Brooklyn uh, said, Hey, like this looks good. Let's have a let's have a chat about this. So we got on the phone, and basically we both said, "This sounds great. Let's go from New York City to Nova Scotia and back." So yeah, about three weeks later, I was in the middle of a month long, two thousand nautical mile trip round trip between New York and Nova Scotia, oh. and man, it was it was the trip of a lifetime. It was a blast. What what months were this? Uh, this was this was July 2022 into August, okay. so about one year after after uh, being bitten by that bug, and something like six or eight months after quitting my my final job as a as an actuary. It was just um. Some piece of equipment turned itself on and it was very loud. I have to go. Sure. <laughs> I hope that wasn't important. <laughs> I don't even know what it is. Oh no. This this is at your friend's place, right? 
Yeah, this is actually my friend's uh, gym. They're they're real big into powerlifting, um, and they have so so they look like powerlifters, and they have two dogs, which are like pit Roddy mixes, and their dogs look like powerlifters. And the dogs <laughs> love me, and they make noise a lot. Uh, so no one is home except for me and the dogs. But I had to come out here to the gym because otherwise the dogs would be like fighting and whining and making noises and like tripping over stuff. So, like I'm out, yeah, I'm out in the like accessory building next to the gym. <laughs> Hence also, uh, of course, uh, Conan the Barbarian. Yeah, I've, seen, I've seen the Conan name. I didn't see the Barbarian himself in the friend, but yeah. Yeah, yeah there got it is. The, uh, I've, your this, friends have priorities in line. Yeah, uh, I've been, uh, I've been uh, best friends with this guy for 30 years now. I'm 36. Um, and this poster has been in all of the spaces that he has had. So it's like this poster is just like an old, an old friend of mine. <laughs> Oh, excellent. In in the gym. So I, I live in, it seems like not a dissimilar situation, but in the gym that we've got here at the compounds, uh, there's this owl poster, just like a giant, like zoomed in owl, just kind of looking at you like this. Uh, and as, as we were like clearing out the place, all the trash from the old, from the old owners of this place, we were about to throw the owl poster into into the back of this trailer that was like destined for the dump, and I was like, "Wait a second. <laughs> and someone started to throw away the owl. I'm like, "No, no, no." So that's how we got the owl in our gym. <laughs> nice. Well, so you've intrigued me. What's this compound that you live in? So uh, back at the just before the beginning of the pandemic, this was on the transition time between my third and my fourth actuary job. I was thinking that I was going to move here from Florida up to New York because that's where the uh, the hub office at the company that I was trying to get that I was trying to advance in was, and that so the action is generally not in Central Florida for my old field, but it's like in places like Chicago, New York, and so on. I was trying to transfer up there, was rejected because they're like, well, we don't want to open the the door from the satellite offices to the the main office, and I'm like. Okay, I'm just gonna find a different job then. So that's it. Anyway, so I, I gave up on the. Uh, this was January 2020, before the pandemic. Oh, wow. uh, so I started a job search, uh, and, and simultaneously moved from my expiring lease apartment over to this new place because it's like, well, I can just hang out for a couple months while I figure out what the next step is. So I asked my friend, "Hey, I know that you have." like this vacant trailer at the compound. Do you think I could like move in for a couple months while I figure out the next step? And he's like, yeah, sure. Then the pandemic started and <laughs> living at this compound in a couple different places in the compound, including, but not limited to the 1970s trailer that eventually fell apart. Uh, the bell tent that I moved into as we learned that we needed to demolish that trailer. Uh, by the way, I found that tent by searching on Google. Really nice tent. Uh, so that <laughs> that's how I found that. Moved into the main house in the compound when the mini house uh, project started getting delayed. And it, it was no longer winter in Florida when we had too many bugs, but when it was too hot and when it started getting too wet outside. So I abandoned the tent and moved into the main house as we finished building this mini house here, which... The project went way longer than we thought it was going to go, but okay. that's how, yeah, that's how those things go. Um, so, and so those are the the four places that I've lived at here on the compound. But it's also a compound because in addition to the main house, the mini house, we've also got the gym slash workshop in the backyard now, um, where the owl is now watching over your games. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I like that too, because uh, we've, we've been talking about like human wisdom at scale and the owl is, of course, the spirit animal of wisdom. So, yeah, that, that sounds like the owl has been as uh, is in the right place or you're in the right place or something like that. The owl and I and all of us together are uh, getting one more rep. <laughs> um, so uh, we were talking, you, you mentioned something about some uh, some adventures you have within the adventure of sailing. Would you like to talk about that? I'm interested in hearing yeah. about these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, and by the way, I should say that one of the reasons why I was attracted to sailing is because of this same thing that you're talking about, this this wanting to develop some broader skills. Mm. Sailing for me, one of the reasons that I felt attracted to sailing was not eventually to like become this professional sailor and just give my life to that, right? right. But rather, it's it encapsulates so many different competencies that a person can potentially have. Mm. Um, you've got you, like on a boat, you've got so much stuff to do. Um, and, and of course there are different situations for that too. Right. So the, the situations are as, as diverse as you're just single handing this one boat on a lake and there's not much required of you. And it goes all the way to what, well, and I'm, kind of framing it as a spectrum right now, although that's not quite the right way of putting it because it's multidimensional in the sense that yeah. you can just live on a boat, but at a marina and yet you've still got some problems to solve. Like, how am I going to be warm? Or how will I eat on this boat? Or how will I keep things maintained, right? So it requires the act of being around boats in general acts to force a person to become competent at many things right and and the things that you have to get competent are at kind of depend on where you're going to take the boat or where you're going to be on the boat so anyway that's uh that's why i wanted to get onto a boat and why i put myself on cruiseseekers.com i love that uh, yeah yeah so i should point out too that one, one of the you asked about adventures on the boat and we're talking about competence right now so let's tie those two things together by telling you about Corsair Canyon. Okay. So this we're four days into the trip, Bob and I on his 27 foot boat, 27, um, that, that maybe is 27. Regardless though, we are four days into the trip between New York and like the middle of Nova Scotia. And we look at this chart at this place called Corsair's Canyon and I get up. So Bob's on watch. He's doing the watch from between 4am and something like 7am. And I come back up to see him in the morning and we're not sailing at this point. We're just motoring because the wind has died down and yet the sea's a little bit bumpy. Uh, so it's kind of making the boat go back and forth like this. It's rocking. And that's annoying in and of itself, but it's especially annoying in this case because the boom, which the boom is the thing that supports the bottom of the sail. It's not in use right now, and the sail is put away on the boom, but because of the rocking of the boat, the boom is going back and forth wildly like this. Uh, not only because of the rocking of the boat, but also because the thing called the, the kicker has malfunctioned. Mm. The kicker is the thing that moves the boom vertically upward to keep it in this, like to keep it contained in this one spot, partially so it doesn't like bounce back and forth crazily like this. And, and I get up to the, uh, to the cockpit and Bob is like, Matt, the boom is trying to kill me. And I'm like, oh, okay, what do we do? Or I ask him, what do we do? And he says, well, we got to fix the kicker. And it's like, that's not happening because there's some kind of hydraulic malfunction going on here. Um, so we didn't know how to fix this like advanced technology of the kicker, which by the way, a kicker is a, is a somewhat recent innovation on sailboats. Mm -hmm. Um, and usually, and in the past, this problem has been solved by just like how you solve many problems on the, on boats with a rope or <laughs> well, actually you can't call it a rope. Sailors line. don't call yeah. ropes their lines. Yeah. Um, so this particular line is called a boom topping lift and the boom topping lift is a line that goes from the aft end. That's the back end of the boom all the way up to the top of the mast. Mm. Here's the problem. We don't have one because we have, we have a kicker to solve this problem, which the kicker is this hydraulic thing that goes from the bottom of the mast to the boom. And that's the thing that's failed. So we need a boom topping lift now. So Bob says to me, well, the one way we could solve this problem is with a boom topping lift. And he explains what it is. Um, and he says, do you think you could climb the mast? And I said, Bob, and I paused because I wasn't sure about this, right? <laughs> All right. Yeah, let's do this. So, man, I ended up climbing a mast in Corsair's Canyon with a climbing harness on. So it was like relatively safe. 
uh, I climb to the top of the mast, and as it's going back and forth like this, as the boat is rocking, the sway of the mast actually gets exaggerated the higher you climb, because think about where the rotation is there. It starts, yeah. to, it starts to sway more and more as you get higher and higher, or the amplitude of the sway, that is. So as, as I see the waves start to come in, I'm like, all right, here it comes. So then you hug the, you hug the mast and stop climbing for a moment, right? And then it's like, all right, the waves have passed. I can keep climbing. And as this rope that I'm going to make the boom topping lift is dangling from me, like I finally do get to the top. I grab this thing from the harness. Uh, I, put the, I put the block into place. And Bob is like incredulous down there. He's like, you actually found a spot to put that thing on there? I, I wasn't sure that, that we actually had a spot to secure this thing to. So I'm like, yeah, Bob, like I, the block's on. And he was, he was happy about that. I threaded, the, I threaded the rope, now a line, because like the raw material is the rope. And when you put it into, when you deploy it, then it becomes a line. Uh. So I, I put the line into place. Uh, sent it back down to him. He tied it to the back of the boom, and we had a boom topping lift. So that was it. And I came back down to the bottom, um, saw that Bob hurt himself pretty badly while watching me. Uh, he he actually fell down while looking up and like banged his leg leg up pretty hard. But he patched himself up. This eighty year old like knew how to do first aid on himself like excellently. And he was like, he was a real trooper about just like figuring that out for himself. So bottom line is we were able to, to take a situation where it's like, this boom is trying to kill us. And like, actually this is going to do damage to the boat. And we figured out a plan. Uh, and I faced my fear of like going up to that, up that mast. Although I was like kind of looking forward to doing something like that. It was actually yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. But yeah, it was still kind of a scary thing to do. Uh, so I faced that fear, came back down and felt during breakfast, like 30 minutes later, like, all right, I feel a little bit more competent now. Mm -hmm. And that was awesome. That is such a cool story. Um, I also just thought that you are now in charge of all nautical metaphors. Any revisions you <laughs> want to make to the life of Flotilla? I think that's just, that's just your job now. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I've, I've, I've basically never sailed. I've, I've done a couple day trips on, uh, in San Francisco Bay. Um, you know, hold that line, pull it, you know, I, I basically know nothing about sailing, but I was, I was looking into sailing back from Europe last year. It didn't work out. Um, but, oh, I, I got to the point of like making some profiles on cruiseseeker.com and places like that and, and getting in contact with people, um, and uh, yeah, like I said, it didn't work out. Um, I might have been arriving back home now-ish. <laughs> and I wanted to leave at like end of August, right? It might have taken me until now to get home uh, just, just because of how that sort of thing works. Um, I vaguely remember these posts of yours where you were talking about slow traveling back. Um, and that was one of the other times when I wanted to reach out when, yeah. you, uh, when you alluded to sailing. I'm like, Oh, I'm into that right now. Let's let's reach out to Tyler. But then I didn't, and I delayed until you finally uh, came out with that explicit outreach version. It's like, all right, now I'm not doing this before. Now it's time. I literally asked for it, uh, <laughs> and I'm so glad you did. Um, but yeah, like the, like something I was impressed with in my um, in in every single interaction I've had with sailing culture and sailing community is the m massive and uh, really rich uh, multi-variant emphasis on competence because i mean we can talk about i mean, you can almost see like like some of my stuff that i've written about skills and competence you can almost see it as like it's almost like a hobby like oh yeah sure whatever but you know if you fail you can just go down to the store competence matters when you're sailing yep. right like it is, it is you and your crew and your boat, and that is all that exists. And so if you can't figure it out, that boom's going to kill you. You're going to sink, like, whatever, you know. Um, and, and, you know, the, the consequences vary between it's going to really suck to the ultimate consequence, right? And so um, I, I was really attracted to that thing. And, and um, while I basically never sailed, I recognized in it similar... Um, not the same, but similar 
approach to competence in climbing, in the climbing community, similar deal, right? Like you're up on a rock, you can't be like, well, you know, I'm not into this anymore. It's like, well, you're 500 feet off the ground. You got 500 feet above you, a vertical wall. It's, it's you, your partner and, uh, you know, your equipment. And, um, it's, it's kind of up to you to figure out this out. So again, it's a, it's a situation where competence matters. And, you know, I have, I have good friends. Um, your partners matter who you're with matters. Right. And, there can be some things like, hey, look, you're a good person. I like you. I will not climb with you. Yeah. Those yeah. are two different things, right? We were talking about spectrums earlier. It's like, well, there, there are multiple dimensions of people. I, I would go out and have a dinner conversation with this person, but I'm not going to let you belay me 500 feet up there. <laughs> it's not happening. Yeah. And it's, and it's, I mean, I think part of one of the reasons is I think these activities can be so, um, meaningful and addicting, uh, addicting, whatever, meaningful, and why people pursue them, even though they might be dangerous, is because it feels like it matters, because it does matter. And like these relationships you have with people, like your relationship with your partner, your relationship with your crew really matters in, in a way that we, we in the culture we live in, I think, often aren't exposed to. Like, we're just not exposed to like, oh, my relationship with this person, like, ultimately, I mean, matters in an ultimate sense, my relationship with this person and like even communication, right? Like I've, um, my relationship with romantic partners I've had has been greatly enhanced by the fact that um, I have climbed and also most of my partners have climbed as well. And it's like, we worked on a relationship as a couple because communication, a climbing team's communication really, really, really matters. Like people, pe you know, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of, you know, specifics we could get into, but like, you know, if, if I say belay off versus the person on the crag two feet away from me says belay off, I really want to make sure that my partner is in good communication and understands who just said belay off, you know? Like, yeah. It, yeah, anyway, anyways, it, it, um, it matters. That's an argument for becoming more than monolingual. So, so maybe, maybe you've got the, the other belay team speaking English. It's like, you should learn some Italian for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just a couple words. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's a lot of things I think too, that it's like, um, you know, if you just think it through ahead of time and say like, okay, this is what's going to happen. This is probably what's going to happen. If something that we think might not happen, let, let's talk through what it is. And it's like, you know, you know so like belaying. It's like, okay, I'm going to go up there. It's this kind of anchor. I'm going to set it. I am not going to ask you to take me off belay, all right? Or I, I would say I'm not planning on having you take me off belay. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to futz around with the anchor. Then I'll ask you to lower me. At no point am I planning on asking you. So if you hear belay off, be suspicious. I, a situation could arise where I would ask for it. But be suspicious. Like visually inspect, you know, and make, make eye contact with me, all these other things. Um, yeah. So yeah, sailing competence, competence matters in the sense of the sense of meaning uh, in activities. Yeah. One of the reasons why I was attracted to sailing, and actually, I I do some rock climbing, although just I'm in Florida, right? So I just climb inside most of the time, and I just boulder, right? Yeah. However, I'm a, I was attracted to climbing. I think that you know this is just me trying to explain it in retrospect, but it seems kind of like I wanted to go not only get that competence, but also to feel some kind of measure of risk. In other words, it does feel like, and this is going back to much earlier in the conversation that you and I are having right now, but it feels like the world is in a risky situation right now. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me. It, it actually doesn't feel like that. And that's, that's the point I'm trying to make here. Objectively speaking, it appears that the world is at risk right now. Um, maybe, maybe nothing will go wrong today or this week or like in the next five years, but it does feel like we are, it does appear that we are in a risky situation. And I just corrected myself again, because again, it doesn't feel that way. So one of the things I was trying to do there was to get a sense or to, to feel put myself in a situation where I could feel like I was in danger and feel like my actions mattered. Mm -hmm. um, so, so sailing in that sense was kind of a metaphor 
So, so it was just, it was also in addition to trying to find that competence and rising up to the occasion and seeing whether I would rise up to that occasion. It was also like, Hey, the world's at risk. Let's go feel some of that risk right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got to feel that not only when climbing the mast, but in a couple other situations too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think experiencing risk also puts some of the things, some other things in your life in perspective. I remember when I first started climbing outside, I would come back to work in the office and things that would bother me before just didn't bother me at all. <laughs> like this, oh, this doesn't matter one way or the other. The worst, worst case scenario, someone yells at someone and it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what are some of these other experiences you had with risk? Um, we almost wrecked the boat while coming out of Halifax on a, on a thing called Black Rock. Ominous. This, this, was, uh, this was us relying a little bit too much on Google Maps, but for the water. Um, it's called Navionics. So we had an iPad that had the nautical chart guiding, guiding us. And we had motored out and we actually started to get under sail. We turned the motor off and we thought that having motored slash sailed for about two and a half hours, that we were out in open water. Generally a good assumption given like all of the other sailing that we had been sailing and motoring that we had been doing up to that point. And given like what we could see around us, looks like open water. Uh, Well, okay. Over to our right, we still had the coast in sight, but going back to prior experience from this same journey, we had the coast in sight while we were in open water for like a day and a half at a time. So it was, it was a good assumption, we thought, that we were in open water. So anyway, I was, I was at the helm and Bob had gone down below to, to figure some stuff out that needed figuring out down there. Um, and I was, and this was, let me come back to that reliance on technology thing. So we didn't advance the chart plotter and another, the chart plotter is this iPad that I was talking about, um, or Google maps for the water. So we let the boat kind of drift off the screen and I thought, okay, well, this is no problem because we're in open water right now. I don't need to see the details. But something, something didn't sit right with me about that. And I was like, all right, I'm going to get off my get off and stop being lazy about this and go and advance the chart plotter. And oh my fucking God, there's a rock right in front of us right now. So when, when I went and like did that little advance on the chart plotter, it didn't explicitly tell me, but it like revealed to me. And then like I did the two and two in my head and I'm like, we've got about three minutes before we like before something goes wrong right now. Um, so, so then at that same moment, Bob comes up and says like, Hey Matt, I know it's like wet out here and and you probably want to like warm your hands up because even in July off the coast of Nova Scotia, it's cold and wet and uncomfortable, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to get out of Florida and go up there to sail. Um, so he said like, you want to come down and get warm? And I said, Bob, we got to turn the boat right now. And I show him the iPad with this black rock right in front of us. And he like, his, he, he, his face goes white, um, so to speak. We both get back up into the cockpit and we're like, (laughs) we assume the positions, right? So it's like, he's at the lines where he's going to change all the sails. That's like this, the harder job to do. I'm at the tiller and I'm going to, I'm going to turn the boat. So it's like ready to tack, ready. We're going through the whole like routine, the routine quickly, just like the, the belay commands you were talking about earlier. We're going through the routine quickly. And it's like, helm's a lee. I push the helm and we start turning the boat to the right. And we can see this rock now coming out of the fog because it's really foggy. We couldn't see any of this stuff before and we just saw it on the plotter. So we see that rock starting to come out of the fog and we're wondering like, okay, it's clear now that we're not going to hit that rock, the one that's actually like above above the waterline, but we don't know like how close we are to whatever we can't see underneath because we have five feet of draft under the boat. We need five feet of clearance. So we don't know while we're turning whether we're going to hit any of this stuff. 
but there's nothing that we can do about it. Yeah. And we're just turning and we're silently waiting. And we wait for a little while, we finish the turn, and about 30 seconds in, we're just kind of like, Bob and I are just looking at this rock and kind of looking around, seeing like, all right, are we going to make it? Thinking, are we going to make it? About 30 seconds pass, 60 seconds pass. And at about that, that time, it becomes clear, like, we're going to be okay. But man, that reliance on, on, on that iPad, thinking, oh, this thing is just going to guide us and thinking, oh, yeah, we're in open water right now. We're going to be fine. I was fucking wrong. And that's what I learned from that experience. Like, you better check. You better check in front of you and you better be sure about where you're taking this thing right now. So we didn't die that day. That is my new metaphor for human global civilization. It's like What's 30 that? years ago, we looked at the map, at, at the Google map thing and we went, oh, fuck. <laughs> and it's like, but, but, but for 30, 50, whatever, how many years? Uh, we, we, we've just been running around being like, how's the lake tack? Blah, blah, blah. But it's, it's just garbage. It's meaningless, right? And so the boat's just like, wiggling a little bit but it's still going right towards black rock yep yeah and, exactly and, and and so and so you're like hey we should invent wings for this thing and and get this thing over there and i'm like start grabbing your shit just like go overboard <laughs> someone else is like yeah oh man now this is a really good metaphor but i mean i really i really really like what you said earlier about um uh th we feel correct me if i get this wrong but we feel like we have no risk, but when we think about things, when we look at the data of whatever particular issue that we're looking at, we're like, oh no, we're, we've got a lot of risk right now. And it's this, it's this weird tension between like, life, life, life is objectively so, so good for so, so many people because of the energy we've got, the ingenuity we've applied to the abundance of energy and all these things, we've fixed so many problems. Um, and so it's like, if you just look in the rear view mirror, we are doing great not that not not that not that there are some problems and some issues and stuff but like objectively speaking we are crushing it as a species uh but then when you look out the front windscreen and you start projecting ahead and looking at the charts you're like we we might be in some kind of a problem here guys uh, we, we might need to be doing something different than what we've been doing uh up until now and yet people are incentivized not to try and see through that fog yeah yeah Matt, this conversation has been fantastic. I am so glad that you reached out and got in contact and that we were able to have this conversation. This, uh, this is going to be the first of, of, of many, several, all of the conversations. So very much looking forward to the next time we talk. And um, yeah, I feel like we've just hit the tip of the iceberg here to, to keep with the nautical based. Man, keep doing what you're doing, Tyler. I'm really enjoying it. And probably not, um, probably not the case that I'm the only person. Well, thanks for saying that.